Y'all ready? You got a copy of the Word of God? I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. If you don't have a copy of the Bible with you, uh, you can use one of the few. If you have a smart device, a lot of times they have the Bible on them. Uh, if you don't have one, call your own. Please let me know after service. I'll get you one for free that you can take home and read. As always, don't trust what I say. Trust what the Word of God says. Okay? So take everything I said in this pulpit. Take notes if you need to. Go and study it uh, when you get home. And check it out for yourself. Now, we've been walking through Romans. I know we've got some visitors, so just kind of catching you up. Uh, going through the book of Romans, verse by verse, step by step. And uh, here lately, Paul has been talking about righteousness in the last couple of chapters. How righteousness is not something attained through the law of Moses. That's, that's what the, the Pharisees felt that it was. They earned righteousness somehow. And of course, all these Gentiles that were around them in the synagogue and the churches where they met. Uh, they just felt like the Gentiles were not attained to the level of righteousness that they had attained to. And a lot of times they would stub their nose at the Gentiles. And so Paul is really hammering this point home that nobody, not one person in this world who has ever lived except for Christ, has ever attained to righteousness by their own merits. Only Jesus has attained to righteousness. Amen? Because he is righteous. Because he is God in the flesh. But Paul is talking to these Gentiles and these Jews in this church about righteousness through faith and not of works. So when we started chapter 4 last week, Paul is really hammering the point home talking about Abraham. And we gave a little bit of reason why last week, why he brought up Abraham. Because A, Abraham was born before the law. So he was born before one could quote unquote earn righteousness, yet the scripture the word of God said that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Before the law ever existed, Paul is teaching these, the, this Jewish people in that day. He said, listen, you never earned righteousness. No one has ever earned righteousness. You cannot earn righteousness. But righteousness is through faith and it's been that way from the beginning. And he brings up Abraham. Another reason he brings up Abraham is because Abraham was the pinnacle of who the Jews looked at for their faith. That was the father of their people, their faith. They found a righteousness. Why? Because Abraham was their father. So Paul is using their example to prove the truth of God, that righteousness is by faith alone. And he, just, and he describes what that faith looks like. We looked at that last week in Abraham's life. He looked at the attitude of faith, and he looked at the humility of Abraham. And while Abraham was humble and trusting the Lord, but over his own inabilities. And he brought up this idea, and Paul painted this picture of those who work to earn something and those who are given something. He said, listen, if you work and you earn a wage, you are due your wage. I mean, how many of you would go to work at a business or a company or wherever, and you work an entire week, you expect a paycheck, correct? Why? Because you deserve that. You have worked for that. And Paul is saying, now, you all are treating righteousness like this. Like, you have worked so hard to be righteous that now, for some reason, God owes you righteousness. Is that the attitude we ought to have? No. Does God owe man anything? Absolutely not. That is the act, act opposite. I can't speak today. That is the opposite of what the Lord wants from us. Not this attitude that God owes me, but this attitude of God gives me. He said, righteousness is a gift. It's not something we earn. It's something that we are given. That's the attitude of faith. He looks at the attributes of faith. You know, Abraham reckoned himself, himself blessed. He was blessed of the Lord. Now, Abraham had problems. Abraham himself was not a perfect individual. He was certainly not somebody that we could put on a pedestal and try to model our lives after, necessarily. Right? We talked about that a little last week, how he went to a town, told the king that his wife was his sister, so the king wouldn't... You know, murder him so he can have this. There were a lot of things that Abraham did that weren't great, okay? It wasn't really great as a husband, but it really wasn't great as a man in general. Nevertheless, God considered him righteous, and Abraham was blessed. He promised him a blessing, amen? And looked at the order of faith. It happened through belief. Abraham believed God was credited in righteousness, and then Abraham went on to do some great things for the Lord. He, in fact, is the father of Israel. Right? He followed the Lord by faith and did many great things, but faith was first. We talked about that, and it's the same today when we put our faith in Christ. I believe there's evidence that flows from that. And that comes to the next point, affirmation of faith. 
There will be evidence that you put your faith and you trust in the Lord, your life will show it. As it did with Abraham, so it will today. If you say you trust something, your life will reflect that trust that you say you have. You all sat down in these pews this morning because you believed that when you sat, it would hold your weight. I saw y'all sit down. Y'all plopped down pretty good. I didn't see anybody uh, easing into it, right? No, you expected it would hold your weight. You believed that when you sat down, that pew would be there to say the Lord. If you truly believe he is who he says he is, your life is going to reflect that trust in your words, in your actions, and these kind of things. That's the affirmation of faith. Now, we stopped halfway through the chapter. The whole chapter is about Abraham. Paul is using Abraham as this example to the Jewish people. We stopped halfway because I think Paul stopped right here and he reshifts our focus. As we are passage today is verses 13 through 25, Paul shifts from a focus on faith, although it's important, we just got to talk about how important faith is, but he shifts it away to something else. Because listen, at the end of the day, faith isn't all there is, is it? Now what do I mean by that? I mean, faith alone won't get you truth, salvation. Let, let me put it to you this way. You thought I was going into something correct, didn't you? No. Let's say I had faith. I believe that tomorrow I'd be rich. Not going to happen. But let's say I believe it. I can make a lot of stupid decisions based on that belief. I can go into a lot of debt today expecting to be rich tomorrow, and then when tomorrow comes, find out that I'm not rich, I'm going to be in some deep, deep doo-doo. Amen? I can believe with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength that if I climb to the top of the pinnacle of this church and jump off, that I can fly. You expect to see me in the skies in this next week? If I could, I'd love it. I promise you. That'd be awesome. But I am not Superman. Here's the point. Faith without a backing means absolutely nothing. You can put your faith in. And listen, there's a lot of faith out there in this world. A lot of faith in different things. Faith in different people. Faith in different ideas. Faith in different policies and politics and theologies and ideologies. All these different things people put their faith in. But what makes the faith? It's not the faith in and of itself. It's what's behind the faith that gives it its power. And that's what Paul is going to focus on the rest of the chapter. He's talking about Abraham's faith, but he's going to focus our attention on what that faith is in. It's not just in any old thing. It's in God himself. Specifically, in the promise of God. You see what I'm saying? Abraham was a man of faith, but not just a faith that he believed he could do anything. You know, some people preach that, right? I'm going to hold this up. I believe I can be whatever I want to be. I can get money, I can have riches, I can have wealth, I can be prosperous, I can be healthy. Listen, you can repeat that nonsense all day long, but as Paul's going to point out, where are you basing that belief? Where are you putting that faith? That makes all the difference. Can I tell you what Paul's going to focus on in this chapter, and as we read through it together, if you underline your Bible, if you write your Bible, highlight your Bible, underline the amount of time Paul mentions the word promise. Abraham's faith was in the promise of God. And it's dependent on the promise of God. First of all, I'm going to look at three things in this chapter. First of all, we're going to look at the promise made. In verse 13, read along with me. Verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is also no violation. God made a promise to Abraham, and it was a promise of inheritance. He said the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world. God made a promise to Abraham one day that one day you and your descendants will be blessed and will be heirs of the world. Abraham's faith was that one day God was going to grant the answer to the promise that he gave him. That he would be heirs to this entire world. That's a great promise. 
Abraham didn't come up with that on his own. Abraham didn't have confidence in that on his own. He had confidence because God told him, you will be heir of the world. And everyone underneath him, all his descendants, would be partakers of all that is the Lord's. And how much is the Lord, y'all? Everything. Amen? It all belongs to him. We serve a sovereign God, a sovereign Lord. It all belongs to him. It was a promise of an inheritance. It was also a promise of endurance. It was made to Abraham. Right? Right there where he was before the law never existed. So it wasn't a promise that had to be attained by following the law. It was made to Abraham, but it was a promise that extended far beyond Abraham's life on this earth. It extended to his descendants to the end of all the ages. It was a promise that endured. It, wasn't, it didn't have an expiration date, is what I'm trying to tell you. Abraham, I will make you this promise. But you make sure you follow up till this day. No, he said, promise? He said, Abraham, from now until the end of the age, I make you this promise to you and to your descendants. You will inherit the world. You will be heirs of the world. And it was a promise of faith. It was a promise that Paul had to trust, or Abraham had to trust. Because Abraham couldn't see the end from the beginning. Abraham couldn't look down the lines of generation after generation after generation and see the fruition of what God had promised. Abraham had to rely on faith on what God promised. He took God at his word. And we see many instances in the Old Testament, and the, most, the one that sticks out more than anything is, of course, with him and his son Isaac as they go climb the mountain. And God has instructed Abraham, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your one and only child. Isaac packed up the wood. Maybe Isaac carried the wood. How would you have felt to be Isaac for that time? All right, where are we going, Dad? We're going to make a sacrifice. Awesome. So we got the wood. You're making me carry the wood. Where is the sacrifice? God provide a sacrifice. And they marched up the hill. Abraham tied his son to the altar. Got ready to sacrifice his one and only son because God told him to. And God said, Whoa! Okay. You believe. You trust him. And the ticket was that ram and the horn was stuck and he was able to get that and take his son off the altar. You know why he did all that? You know the world would have called him foolish for trusting God like that? You know, the world would have absolute fit today if we were to do something like that. Have such trust in the Lord that we would walk out on such a limb. The world would absolutely go nuts and they would persecute us for it. But because Abraham trusted God, it was credited to him for righteousness and God provided the sacrifice in the place. Of life. Listen, there's so many sermons based on that whole ordeal. That I want to get into, but I'm not going to get into today, other than just to tell you that God made Abraham a promise. That's where his faith was. It wasn't just in anything, it was in the promise of God that God had made towards Abraham. And by the way, as Paul is preaching about this promise of God made to Abraham, he said it was a promise kept. We go on in our chapter, verse 16. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Of who? All of us, right? What not one specific people, but I want to remind you of the promise, was to all nations. He said it was the promise of who is the father of us all. Abraham is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, a father of many nations, I have made you in the presence of him, in the presence of, him, in the presence of God, whom he, Abraham, believed, even God, who gives life to the dead, and holds into being that which does not exist, in hope against hope, he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which hath been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Paul is pointing out the promise of God made to Abraham and the promise of God kept through his manifested presence. And he's pointing to Jesus here. 
What was God's ultimate promise to Abraham? He said, in my presence, my promise will be fulfilled. And here we are, post-Christ, being born in this world. We have the presence of God on this earth, walking with us, talking with us. And then beyond that, the Holy Spirit of God who dwells within us. The promise, presence of God has been fulfilled. In other words, God made a promise, and God kept his promise. Not only of God's presence here among us through Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, which literally translated means God with us, but the promise of life from death, creating something from which there was nothing. As Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to take the payment of our sin, he was dead and he was buried, and three days later, walked out of the grave. Life from death, once again, the promise of God to Abraham fulfilled in Jesus. God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen. And it goes further. God's promise to Abraham of his presence, Jesus. God's promise to Abraham of life from the dead, Jesus. And God's promise that not only Abraham or his descendants, but that he would be a blessing to what? Many nations, to all the world. Can I echo once again the gospel promise kept of Jesus who died for the sins of all mankind, not for a certain few, not for specific people, but for every human being that has ever and will ever exist on this earth, Christ died for them. The blessing is to all nations. God's promise Yes, Abraham was a man of great faith. But Abraham's faith was in a God who made a promise to him and kept that promise. And so we get to the promise, believe, verse 19. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, remember, God had promised him descendants. He had, as of yet, had no children. All that promise had to be fulfilled through his wife and his seed. Verse 20, yet with respect to the promise of God, Abraham's faith in the promise of God, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, because Abraham had this type of faith in what God had said and what God could do, therefore it was credited to him as righteousness. It was faith in who God is. It was faith in what God has said. It was faith in a God of promise. It wasn't just faith in anything. Abraham believed God over his own abilities. That's what Abraham believed. He said, God, you are able to do far more than I could ever ask or think. You can do abundantly more. It is not based on my limitations. It is not based on my worth. It is not based on my goodness. It is not based on what I think I can do. My belief, my faith, Abraham's faith, was based on who God was and is and what God can do, not what we can do. Listen, that's pivotal for our faith today because we are a people, a flawed people, in a very fallen and flawed world. But our faith is not in us. Our faith is not in the church. Our faith is not in the pastor. Our faith is not in our spouse. Our faith is not in our children. Our faith is certainly not in our president. Our faith is in God alone. Do you trust Him today? Amen. I know we all struggle. I know we all face difficulties. But is God in control or isn't He in control? Can I tell you His promise that He is in control? Amen. Can I tell you that he has promised that he is working all things, including your situation out, for our good and his glory? That is a promise of God. I believe in the promise of God, not because of my circumstance, certainly not because of me, but because God is able. 
and he endured. He did not waver. He continued believing. As each new step, as each new day that Abraham encountered, he had to take a new step of faith. He had to wake up the next morning and say, I believe God for yesterday. He has gotten me to today. I'm going to continue to walk step by step and trust that God is going to carry my footsteps wherever they go. Can I tell you this morning, you've made it this far. God has got you this far. Amen? Amen. Maybe it's been hard. Certainly some of you have struggled far more than I've struggled. Maybe I've struggled a little bit more than you have struggled. I don't know your struggles, but I know this. You've made it to today. You will make it to tomorrow. God will. He grew by faith. Day by day. Giving glory to God. Understand his attitude through this whole process. Now, I'm not saying Abraham never had a bad day. I'm not saying you never had a bad day. But I'm saying the pinnacle of our faith lies in who God is. Whatever we encounter, whatever situation we encounter on a day to day basis, we have to encounter it with the knowledge that God knows what I'm facing. God knows the enemy. God knows the, the, the struggle. And God has promised he would never leave me nor forsake me so I can enter into whatever circumstance with contentment. With peace, even when everything else around us seems to be falling apart, I can trust that God is still in control. Amen. And as you encounter every one of those trials, and you go through those trials, and you come out on the other side of those trials, your faith is that much stronger. Faith to faith, glory to glory, as the scripture says. And it is that belief that Abraham had that gave him the confidence to take his son Isaac up to the devil. Is that faith that Abraham had to continue to pass on from generation to generation. You understand that the Old Testament scriptures was passed on orally in the beginning. It wasn't written down for a while. A lot of that was oral tradition passed on from father to son, from father to son, on and on and on through the generations. It had to have faith of Abraham to trust God enough. I and mean, if he was talking to his son to say, son, I need you to pass this down to your son. Why? Because it was God's promise and it's important. And God means what he says. And I want to make sure that your children and your children's children and your grand, 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 great, 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 great grandchildren know the promise of God. So I walk each day confidently more and more, being fully assured that, that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. That's where the evidence of his faith came. That's where the fruit of Abraham's faith came. Not because he just had faith. It was what he had faith in. That makes all the difference in this world as you go about your day. What do you put your faith in? What are you trusting in? We trust in a million things. We trust in our car to get us where we want to go. We trust in the seams of our garments that our clothes are going to stay on as we're out in public. We trust that the pews, the chairs we sit in are going to stay erect and keep us held up. We put our faith in a lot of things, but then when things get hard, how can we lose the faith that God is above all of these things, in control of all things, and has a plan he's working out for all these things? And then we have to try right? And then we, we struggle. Verse 23. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him. This is Paul once again saying, this is all wasn't just for Abraham. We've been talking about Abraham the whole chapter. It all wasn't just about Abraham. But it was for us. Paul saying, for those that, uh, of his day that are telling you, it's for us in our day as well, verse 24, more, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgression, and was raised because of our justification. Paul hammers on the promise given to Abraham because it was performed in Jesus and it was a promise passed on to you and I today, hopefully made on the day that you said yes to Jesus. And hopefully you have said yes to Jesus. That you have put your trust, you have put your faith in a God who is able to save, a God who has died for your sins, a God who is able to wipe that slate clean, and you can stop struggling and striving each day to hope, perhaps think that you can be good enough one day to be in the presence of God. You have trusted, hopefully, that there was a time and place in your life where you have confessed your sin before the Lord. You have confessed.
confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. He took away your sins. He, he washed your slate clean and he filled you with his spirit and his presence is with you today. I pray that that is true for you tonight or this morning. <coughs> and if it's not, today is the day. Trust him. Our faith is in him. Trust him. Don't trust me. Don't trust each other. That's the funniest thing when we talk about you. We give a lot of marital advice and in marriage counseling. And she's like, oh, I don't feel like I can trust my spouse. Good. <laughs> Nobody said you had to trust your spouse. That wasn't part of the deal. You talk about my wife now. I don't trust me. You think I have to have her trust me? No, don't trust me. Don't trust each other. It's not about trust in who we are. Trust God. Trust his promises. Trust that he is doing what he said he would do from the very beginning. And what did he say? What does the scripture say? What does the word say? This is where I put my faith and my trust that God is who this says he is. God is who he said that he is. Not who the, the world has so many ideas of who God is. The world has so many ideas of what God is going to do or is doing. But I'm telling you, he already gave us the end from the beginning. He told us what his promise was. He gave us his word. Trust his promise. Don't trust your own power. Don't trust your own opinion. Don't trust your own position, your pride, your politics. Throw all of that out the window. Your faith is not in the flesh. Our faith is in Jesus. That's the backing of our faith. Have you put your faith in him? in him? Do you trust him each day? Do you trust that when you walk out of this place, no matter what you encounter, no matter what you encounter, that Jesus is still on his throne? Do you believe that? Amen. Listen, it's easy to say that when you're surrounded by people who all believe the same thing. You're sitting in pews and you get your dress up and you look nice you're out here and you put a smile on your face. Oh, do you trust Jesus? Oh, yeah, I trust Jesus. And you go out these doors and, and you step your toe or, or somebody cuts you off on the, on the highway or you get in an argument with your spouse or something happens in your life. What? Is Jesus the same then as he is now? Yes. Absolutely. So trust him just as much there as you do here. Trust him in the midst of the attack just as much as you trust him when you're at the altar. Trust him in the good times and in the bad times. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is unchanging. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You say, Pastor, you don't know what I've been through. I don't. And you're right, I don't. But guess who does? Jesus. He knows exactly what you've been through. He knows what you're going through. And guess what? He knows what you're going to face tomorrow. Something you don't even know. And he's already given you, gave him, given you his word. He's given you his promise. Don't have faith in just anything. Have faith in what he said. Have faith in who he is. That's Abraham's faith. That's where we get our righteousness. That's why the Apostle Paul could write later in Scripture. He said, whatever situation I find myself in, I can be content. I, I can be content. Whether I'm hungry or whether I'm poor. Whether I'm rich or whether I'm poor. Whether I'm out going free or whether I'm stuck behind the prison bars in a cell chained up, which Paul had found himself on many occasions. Paul said, I find myself content because I trust who my God is. So I'm asking this morning. I want you to ask yourself, and I'm not out loud, <laughs> ask yourself in your heart, do I really trust the Lord for who He says He is? Do I really believe that He is sovereign, that He knows you, that He knows my situation? Do I really believe that God is able? Do I really believe that God can lift me up out of that miry pit and keep me walking on the path of righteousness? Do I believe that even when I fall, that he's there to pick me back up, set me back on the path, and keep me going. Do I believe? 
where your faith is. If it's in anything else but what he said, 